The goal of this podcast is to help you break in and thrive in advertising. This week, we're lucky enough to have Josh Ingram. Josh is a brand strategist and management consultant who has spent time leading teams at Interbrand, Straight Line, and Jack Morton. But now he's the founder and principal of Most Wanted Co., a strategic growth consultancy that intertwines brand, innovation, and performance. Today, we discuss the parallels between the music studio and the boardroom, how we cross the chasm into marketing and advertising, how to define your own formula, and become most wanted in the marketing and advertising industry. So be sure to tune in, and I'm your host, Cooper Kolvig. Kick it, Mikey. Josh, it's a pleasure to, to have you on. How are you? How are things going? I'm good, man. Just rocking and rolling and uh, excited to be here and and talk about all the all the cool stuff that we got lined up for today. So thanks for having me. Um, I'm with you, man, of, of course. You know, with all of our guests, we, we like to start off with their, their breaking and entering story into the industry. So let's get started there and uh, we can jump in. Awesome. Um, so uh, I guess if you roll back the tape uh, to when I was coming out of college, I, uh, I studied music and philosophy at Emory University and, uh, you know, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I uh, knew that I wanted to combine sort of creativity and business, um, started researching all these ad agencies um, and landed at, um, at a, a, a big brand consultancy called Airbrand straight into the onto the uh, strategy team um no rotation or anything like that and uh kind of cut my teeth there working on on brand positioning brand architecture brand valuation um and then uh you know yeah just kind of got thrown into it fell into it uh and uh and yeah just been kind of going going with it since then i i also had a tech startup at that time uh simultaneously so that was also a a crash course, if you will, on uh, on kind of raising some some pre seed funding and uh, and uh, working out your team and and building a technology product. So uh, it was a very compact crash course on uh, on brand building and operations from the get go. That's wild. Uh, we can jump into the entrepreneurship stuff in a little bit, but I know you, know, you went to school not particularly, you know, going to uh, go to school for advertising or, or marketing yeah. at all and that you know i know you know you personally are a huge uh, music guy and it's a, a huge um part of your life how do you go from you know that being your your primary you know mode of operation and and yeah there to switching into marketing and advertising yeah so there's there's two um there's two things i'll 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 go for on that um so let's start first with philosophy, which was my major in college. Um, and so in, in philosophy, everything is, is built around making an argument and building it formally upon the argument that was put in place prior, right? So there's a very sort of formulaic way that a lot of these folks, um, you know, uh, would sort of, um, you know, put together their case for, you know, why we experience the world a certain way, if it's Galileo, right? Or, or why... Um, you know, psychology impacts us in a certain way. If it was Carl Jung or, um, you know, or even in political philosophy going, you know, uh, folks like Hobbes and Locke. So um, there's a very kind of, um, uh, there's, an, there's an inner message and there's a sequential way of, of sort of making that, that case in philosophy. And I think that that lends itself very well to brand building and brand strategy, right? Because you really have to interrogate the core argument that you're trying to make, um, whether that's at a corporate brand level um, or whether that's at a human level, right? What you're trying to tap into and what you're trying to articulate as a, as a brand from the core and the inside out. We talk about making the outside match the inside when we're building brands, right? Making the look, feel, messaging, content, all that stuff match who the organization is. So philosophy is actually a really, really good, I think, thing for folks to um, do some reading around or, or if you're a philosophy major to, to, to not sort of be intimidated by, oh my God, this isn't relevant to what I want to do because it's really, and this is like the classic liberal arts, I guess, um, 
you know, argument, but it's, it really is about like the thinking, right. And making the arguments that you're making and sort of, um, really interrogating that, that core. Um, but on the music side, uh, there's a, there's a lot that's relevant for building brands. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to do a bunch of work for a number of years in, in Sonic branding, got to build the Sonic brand for, uh, brands like Dolby, uh, Accenture, PayPal. And, um, the thing about music that is so powerful and sound, any sound or any sensory, uh, experience, uh, that we, that we have as human beings, that it, it triggers things in our brain. It triggers emotions in our heart. It triggers memory and synapses, uh, in our brain. Right. And, you know, when you're building a brand, that is what it is all about. You are trying to get people to remember you right before you know, or like, you know, before you've even contacted them or before you put an ad in front of them or a piece of media, you're trying to get people to feel something, right? Music has this power to move people. It has this power to stop you in your tracks. It has this power to freak you out, right? If you hear an alarm, you know, or, or uh, you know, if somebody, uh, you know, messages you on your phone, right? These are really um, kind of, uh, you know, synaptic responses. Um, physical re responses. So, so music is, is really, really, um, really, really relevant in that way. And then it, it's also relevant around creativity in general, the, the way that musicians go about their songwriting process, the way they, they, um, make records, uh, who they collaborate with, how they collaborate, where they get their inspiration. These are all things that music is just the medium of expression. Um, it's just the me it's just the mode of output for, for a powerful creative idea or a message, right? And we're doing the same thing with brands and with products. Um, there's a, uh, there's a famous quote, uh, by, by Steve Jobs. He gave this interview called, um, called the last interview. Uh, and, uh, and in it, he talks about how he doesn't just hire, you know, people who are amazing computer scientists. He hires people who are amazing poets, musicians, writers, historians, and they're also amazing computer scientists. Um, and and he, he does that because those people are able to instill a soul into the brand, to have the products not just be code or computer science, right? Not just software. Um, they, they're able to use their computer science and their programming skills to create products and innovate and make products that actually make people feel something that have the same emotional response when you engage with that product or that brand that you would when you hear a song on the radio or, you know, wherever that takes you back to a moment in time, right? His whole thing is that, that there's a, there's a business impact and a, um, uh, an efficiency, if you will, to treating product services and brands as, you know, as artistic expression or as a medium of expression. So that's another thing that I, um, I really, I really take close to heart and that, um, has really influenced the way that I think about what we do. Um, and that's the, that's the really fun stuff. That's the high level stuff. That's the brand building that, you know, that we, we, we love to do and that I love to. That's super interesting. There's a ton we can pick apart there. Um, and I think a common thread that, that even I noticed or, or something that's super interesting to me is you find that frameworks from Carl Jung and archetypal uh, characters be, like coming back from more than just the philosophy class in school and attributing it to a business and how you know, a brand or a business could um, you know, solve a, a consumer need and what those, you know, natural like tendencies and people have been to build those archetypes all the way to, um, even, you know, Maslow hierarchy of needs being used as a framework in branding in different capacities as well to, um, kind of laying down that, that, you know, link between philosophy and then you have sociology and all these different modes of, of, of communication classes. Um, a major link that we see is uh, you have these creatively minded people, people who are critical thinkers and are building a uh, case like um, work, uh, like you mentioned, when you're talking about philosophy and building those those arguments, um, realizing, you know, at least for me, I was getting towards the end of my career as a student. 
um, where, you know, I wanted to be creative. I, mm. I wanted to get out and, but I also, you know, hadn't had a ton of, uh, exposure to business and, and what yeah. that really looked like. And the advertising and, and marketing world is, is one where, you know, I think a ton of people who think that way or are gravitated towards that style of, of thinking end up in, in this world. Um, what are some ways that you've drawn the lines between creativity and, and business? And um, how did that go for you in your early career? So I, I think I'll zero in on some of the, well, okay, there's frameworks and then there's just kind of moments of truth, I think. Um, there is a story that I uh, am remembering now. Uh, I can remember uh, I was at Iran and we were doing, we we're actually doing a brand strategy for, um, uh, for Microsoft for a, a, this was 10 years ago, it, it was for, uh, you know, part of their productivity suite. Um, and I was with, uh, another guy, uh, a, a writer, my sort of creative partner. And, uh, we'd gone through, you know, I, I was a strategist. I'd gone through all the research and, you know, we, uh, we were going through all the, the product roadmaps and, um, we had tested this product in front of consumers and, you know, it, it was intense, um, but we started to take the outputs of going through all that research and started it to sort of come up with creative territories. There was, um, I remember the biggest, uh, the biggest hurdle for consumers at the time, and I'm sure it's the same in certain industries now, um, you know, it was just like using a new technology stack, right? Like it was all about uh, the, the hardest hurt consumer hurdle that you had was getting people to switch, right? Especially in something like IT. Um, so, you know, we came up with this whole creative platform around, you know, familiarity and around, you know, making the unfamiliar familiar and, and, you know, the moments in our lives where, you know, we had these sort of moments of truth or these moments of epiphany where we realized that there was a better way to work, um, and that we could, you know, get more done or spend more time with our friends or spend more time on our creative pursuits. Uh, if we could just get familiar with a new workflow. Right. If we could just be open to that. So, um, you know, so we, and, but this was like over beers on a Friday after we'd been <laughs> like pulling our hair out. And it was me and my buddy Ben, who's now um, a, a poet and a writer and a professor. You know, I mean, perfect example of another creative guy that sort of fell into business and just crushed it and then went on and did, a, you know, did a whole load of other interesting things. Right. It fits the Steve Jobs narrative perfectly. Uh, and so there was a kinship there in that, on that process, uh, and, and with that art, that creative partner. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, there have been those moments throughout my career where, you know, I've, I've come across other, um, creatives in business, uh, or other partners in business where we're able to have that kind of, uh, that creative spark or that creative partnership. And I had never experienced that, you know, all my life, all through college and, and even in my twenties. I was, you know, I was always the best, the thing that I was best at was always music. It was always songwriting or, um, you know, uh, doing session bass work or, uh, you know, performing and backing up songwriters. Um, and so, you know, having those moments where like, oh my gosh, you know, you can, you can have a creative partnership in a business setting for a brand and there that's really rewarding. That's like a, that's kind of like a game changer. So I think those are, those are, those mo are moments that I really cherish throughout this career. Um, and that, and that can be surprising. Um, they can, they, they can be unexpected. And I think that uh, when you were, I think, especially when you're in, there's so much pressure to figure out what you're, what you're going to be or what you're going to do. And, you know, and, um, you know, when you're, when you're coming out of college and stuff like that, and you just kind of never know where the road's going to take you and you might find yourself in scenarios or jobs or situations where you know you had no idea that it could bring the passion out of you in the in the same way that other things did that you experienced when you were you know in a different phase i think uh that's certainly been the experience for me yeah and it's weird how those things popped up i'm not even totally sure if i found whether it's the industry or like an industry i'm working on as a strategist or um, something in parallel of what we do every single day that, you know, there are definitely things that tap or get close, but, um, when it happens, it happens and it's, and it's like lightning and it's one of totally. those, those best feelings ever. And where you kind of, I guess, uh, feel your, 
the balance between the core segments of who make you you and and what you're doing um professionally almost like the ikigai framework that the the japanese use that's yeah um super interesting so going into the frameworks if, just to nerd out a little bit and build on what you were saying before you know i think the one that's that's really been making the rounds has been um i think it's joseph campbell's hero's journey um, you know, right that, you know, where, you know, you sort of have this, you know, you, ha you have, uh, you know, life as we know it. And then it, you know, you, you, you hit a, a roadblock or you hit a challenge and you have to go on this sojourn and it's a rite of passage and then you have a resolution and then things evolve. Like these are, um, you know, like going all the way back to, you know, the caveman era, right? Like these are storytelling techniques that have stood the test of time. Um, a lot of folks are product. I've been productizing that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different frameworks out there, whether it's uh story doing or ABT, even ABT draws a lot of parallels from, um, uh, from the Euro's journey. So, uh, you know, th there's a lot of them that are out there. We really like to use, uh, Harvard business school positioning sort of tried, tried and true uh, framework, but, you know, I would also encourage folks to, you can go and look at uh, award-winning advertising and creative work, like even go and looking at the can lines and, you know, go and, go and try to reverse engineer how those stories were, t were told, you know, did they flip, uh, a narrative on its head? Did they challenge you to imagine a war? I, I was just listening to the, um, CMO from ESPN, uh, last uh, two weeks ago and, you know, their whole ad campaign around imagine a world without, right. It's like, there's the whole storytelling technique when they when ESPN broke out was just, you know, um, uh, you know, challenging people to imagine what life would be like without sports, without ESPN, right? It, it, it's not believable, right? So, so there's a lot of these frameworks that are really interesting. And um, I don't think there's any one. Uh, I think that there's, but there's a lot of good ones. The, the Zhang stuff is really good. Um, there, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah, uh, the more you can get your hands on the like more tools in in uh, your toolbox, you can pull out when you know the situation. When you see it, you're not totally sure what it's going to be, but then you can apply it. Um, and you know, it's it's hard to find those as well. But I think something that's super challenging for aspiring marketers and advertisers, or even people in the industry today, is like industry jargon and mm. buzzwords. You have all these different terms. Even the word strategy means eight different things to yes. every single person who says it. Um, how did you make sense of these? Are there any in particular that that speak more personally to you that um, you'd like to combat the confusion around? Yeah, sure. I think brand purpose and purpose are is probably the one that I would I would jump into the ring on. I think that there, you know, a brand purpose really is your reason for being. It's your, it's your why, right? If we go and look at, at the way like Simon Sinek talks about it, um, the purpose should be sort of the, the reason why you get out of bed every day and go to work at a, at a brand. Um, it should be a measuring stick for whether something is on brand or not, you know, or whether it, why are we living up to our purpose? So a purpose does not, a purpose should be a, a guiding belief for an organization. It should, it, it is not necessarily, and this is where the confusion happens. It is not necessarily like only about social impact. Although a brand absolutely, you know, should find the places where it's, its purpose is aligned with impact. And, and so I think there's a lot of confusion out there around this idea of, of, of purpose. Um, and I think that, that, also brands can stray too far. I think that that's one of the dangers for building brands right now is, you know, if we try to make, if we, if we equate a brand's purpose with sort of purpose marketing or social mark, social impact marketing, then I think it's, it, it can get dangerous because brand may step too far. We may position them or promise things that are not believable or that, um, you know, brands are businesses, right? So they are not nonprofits. Right. And so I think there and, and 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 you can catch a lot of flack with customers who are going to call bullshit on you if if we sort of mix that up. Um, that being said, I think social impact, um, the, you know, this this other definition around purpose, having a, a, you know, a purpose strategy or an impact strategy or a community strategy, um, 
you know, or a sustainability strategy. These are, these are things that are incredibly important. Uh, but I think there's a lot of confusion in marketing around sort of like mixing, mixing those two words up. Um, brand architecture is another one that gets mixed up and gets thrown around. Um, you know, the sort of in the classical sense, brand architecture is, you know, it is portfolio management of brands. You know, understanding the hierarchy between product and corporate brands, sub brands, strategic sub brands, endorsement strategies, you know, it, it, through the MA process when you're integrating, you know, uh, n- you know, new assets, new investments into a brand portfolio. How do you, how do you do that in a way that, um, retains asset value and increases it with the point of the MA, um, and, and to realize additional value and synergies. So, um, that's sort of like brand architecture in the, in the sort of, classical sense. And sometimes that gets confused with a brand stra- with a brand strategy or with a brand platform really would even be a better word for it. You know, the purpose, the position, your pillars, um, you know, the proof points, reasons to believe the, the, the thing, the core, core part of the brand, a uh, brand platform, brand framework. So I think brand architecture gets confused. Uh, there's also a big difference between strategy and strategies. Um, or brand strategy and brand strategies. You can modify the term strategy. You can use strategy in a singular form and apply it towards different marketing channels. Um, it, you know, strategy plays a different role based on the marketing channel. If you're doing creative strategy, social strategy, brand strategy, um, the strategy has a different role to play. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that, I mean, there's a whole minefield in there. Uh, you know, I think it, I think it also depends on, uh, again, where you're playing. If you're a strategist, you know, are you playing in a media channel or are you playing at the business level or at the brand level, right? I think the strategy that you develop, strategy that you go out and sell to clients is going to have a different role. Um, and it's a different service value proposition based on where you sit in marketing services than in um, the marketing operate, operations of the client on the client side. Interesting. So kind of on that note, I know a major hot topic within the industry right now is, you know, the concept or, or belief that within marketing and advertising, um, most CMOs are, are senior marketers and, and even those teaching the next generations of, of marketers and advertisers um, that that these people are incredibly tactically driven, kind of like you mentioned, the strategy on like a specific media channel right. um, level. And I know at, at Most Wanted, um, you guys are that intersection between brand innovation and performance. And brand and performance can mean two super different things. How do those two play off of each other yeah. if you are someone who's at the you know the business c-suite level um making decisions at like a brand architecture like strategic brand partner um and what does it look like for someone who might be more in the weeds on the performance side yeah. and, and how can you get the best out of those two things or even just wrap your head around those concepts for for someone who's coming out of school where they're just kind of like yeah here are the four p's go make a plan right <laughs> Yeah. So I think, I think that marketing is changing and it's changing fast and it's been changing fast, even just in the last three to five years, there's so many new channels. There are so many new products that come out on, on platforms, media platforms and social platforms. Um, it, it's hard to even keep up with it all. Um, and so the capability set has increased. The data sets ha- have multiplied. Um, right. And so it's all kind of blending together. Um, and there's, a, there's really, uh, a, a effective, pr- uh, products that are out there, media products that are out there in order to get your brand in front of, uh, you know, in front of, uh, of consumers and in front of your audience. But I think there's been this sort of rush to find the silver bullet. That's certainly what I saw, um, as I was freelancing for agencies across every marketing channel, right. Um, social brand, um, TVC and above the line digital, um, all these things were sort of crashing into each other, right? Anytime you would do an initiative, all the channels needed to integrate and support each other. Um, and so there's there's sort of been a mad rush to just chase the silver bullet, chase the latest shiny ad channel or or, or media object, right? And and we lose um, the fundamentals of brand building, the the you know the the things that drive long term value, 
If you talk to most performance marketers, good ones, or you talk to, um, you know, a, a really solid media strategist, they want that customer thinking about the brand before that, you know, they've even served them an ad. Um, and so at brand strategists, we, we cannot be afraid to, to get in the weed uh, and, and use this tech, uh, use this stuff to deploy um, our, our creative. But we've got to uh, also not lose sight of the fundamentals. We, we, we cannot. And, and so we counsel our clients on this. We are all about um, bringing purpose and performance together. These are things that are a match made in heaven. They're, but they are too often treated in silos by marketers um, and by, by clients. And so there, there's an operational conversation that we believe needs to happen on the client side to break these silos. It's very classic consulting case. Um, right. You know, you need to have brand marketers and performance marketers working together. Um, you need to have creative teams and strategists, you know, involved in that process. Um, so there, there is a real, um, operational component to this, but what I saw happening was all of these channels kind of crashing and colliding. Um, and, uh, I love building brands and I love tech and I wanted to bring those two things together. And so, you know, our entire, um, purpose and brand is around making marketers and marketing most wanted, um, making sure that these two worlds of purpose and performance or, or brand and performance are not operating in a silo, that they're coming together um, into one to, to help our clients be most wanted and not, not hated. Um, so we're kind of out there. We got a chip on our shoulder we're trying to get, get marketers the respect uh, that they deserve. I love that. That's definitely where I think a newer word within the industry is, is starting to arrive of, of integrated or, or integrated strategies or yeah. whether it's purpose or, or performance side of it. Um, to what extent do we think, and you mentioned the operational side of it, we, we kind of live in this world where you have all of these different agencies, um, tech platforms to, to help agencies do what they do siloed in specific channels all the way out to just specific practices. How do you think that that's set us back from, from being integrated or, or working together? And, and how can people who are at these different silos or different spots find ways to end up pushing the most important narrative, which is, you know, an effective outcome for the clients that we're all working for? Yeah, I think that the sort of traditional way um, uh, of thinking about it is kind of uh, in a vertical way, like, uh, you know, in a channel oriented way. And I think that, uh, again, these channels are are blending. I think we need to have like multi multidisciplinary teams. And I think clients need to think of themselves uh, or, or at least educate themselves as multidisciplinarians to a certain degree. Obviously, you're going to build teams around specialties, but you you cannot be uh, a foreigner to, you know, new channels that are that are popping up. And it sounds sort of like so simple to say, um, but I think that marketers really need to take ownership of their analytics. They need to take ownership of um, of their performance media, um, especially brand marketers. They need to have a seat at the table. Um, and so I think we have to, to, you know, evolve how we are thinking about it from a channel perspective and think about these things as more integrated from the beginning. Um, you know, everyone has wanted to grow like a technology company, right? That's, you know, they want, everyone wants to be a unicorn. Obviously, we've sort of hit a time period, you know, this year in 2023, where I think that that lid of red hot growth has been, you know, 10 years of it or 12 years of it has been sort of, that lid's been blown off. Um, and so there is a, an increased focus on profitability now. Um, and, and I think that that is going to force people to think long term and think about um, what the uh, sort of uh, integrated impact is of, of channels working together, right? Looking at the incrementality, looking at media mix modeling, there's a lot of smart folks out there talking about this uh, and doing some really good work. So I think that that's what we're gonna see more of. Interesting. Do you have like a comment on whether that's why you're seeing a lot of these these larger brands and businesses start building larger in-house teams to keep it all together in the first place? So I think that that's an interesting, that's a really, really interesting question, Cooper. I think that in-housing is going to continue. 
Um, I think especially with AI, that's going to definitely drive efficiencies. And so I think the conversation is going to come back to value uh, for sure, value and impact. Um, I think that we also have access to so much content and so much, so many educational resources now. I think it's going to put increased pressure on folks on the inside to know more. And like I was saying, know everything. Uh, and so I think we have to be, I think folks are going to have to be very careful about sort of where they draw the line and then, and also how they position themselves. I think that, um, you know, there's also been a evolution in terms of the creator economy as well, right? Where, um, anybody can be a content creator. I think that that also plays a role here as well. I think that, you know, you are seeing now, um, the creator economy go right into, uh, the world, the traditional world of employee engagement. Um, and, and just, I mean, just go on LinkedIn, you know, I mean, folks are building careers around the content that they create and they are also employees or they're getting hired as employees. I think, um, I, I saw someone, uh, I don't know if it was the chief TikTok officer or somebody just got hired to be CMO, <laughs> like as a TikToker, but you know, these are, these are the things that are happening. So I, I think it's, that's like a tectonic shift for brands. Um, and I think that again, like we all need to think of ourselves as creators, uh, because it's not just a ver it's not just like a, 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 a channel thing. I think we all have an opportunity to share knowledge and share ideas and share content. And that's not going away. That that's only going to accelerate. Yeah. It can easily be a way to, to get a competitive edge as like yourself coming into the industry as well. If we're going to be creating or, or directing the, the creative for, for brands and businesses, it, it would definitely make sense. I think for, for anyone who's looking to, you know, sell themselves and, and break into the industry to, to look at the creator economy as a means of, of getting a leg ahead and, and doing it in a purposeful way to your point that, that really speaks to you. Um, you know, we've gotten super deep into the weeds and into the marketing world. Um, and all the, the craziness that's going on. We have all these different concepts that to your point, getting back to, to the basics of, of brand building and, and remembering that, um, you know, building future demand and, and is, and the, you know, large scale brand advertising and, and marketing that we're doing is an act of, of repetition, or I've even heard you, you know, mention it as softening up consumers yes. or, or, um, even, uh, you know, harvesting uh, existing demand while making sure that you're planting the seeds for for future demand but um on top of understanding and, and gathering all this this knowledge that's uh to your point coming quicker and quicker within the industry um how do you balance that with you know the creative side of yourself the the part of you that that loves music or, or the different aspects of you and, and when was it that you thought that you had a strong enough grasp of these different concepts within the marketing world to start building your own formula and, and melding sure. the two worlds? Yeah, totally. Um, I, you know, we talk about the 10,000 hour rule, right? Um, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't know how many hours it actually is, but you know, it, it, it was probably after about, you know, eight or nine years, um, of kind of doing this brand strategy work that I started to realize that, um, you know, that my, prof my proficiency at it had reached or exceeded the level, you know, that I had, um, as a musician, um, as a songwriter, as a bass player, um, as a keyboard player. So, um, that was a big shift for me. Um, and but it opened up a whole new world. And I, and as I mentioned, I had also started to have sort of creative experiences with other folks where I realized that I could kind of like get that, uh, some of that adrenaline rush, you know, in the boardroom. Um, and so, you know, so I think that, that definitely changed the, uh, changed the equation for me. Interesting. Would you say that there are like parallels between when you were creating music or, or being in the studio to to being in the boardroom and, and breaking down those, those hard, hard why questions and getting to sure. the root of a problem for a client. 
Yeah. So um, I always say that, that this comes down to vibes, right? Um, if you're running a meeting, uh, if you are facilitating um, alignment between, between stakeholders, um, you know, if you are facilitating a creative work session, um, it is all about the vibe in the room and your job is to create that experience, to create th that vibe that's going to lead you towards the conclusion that you need to get to in, you know, 30 minutes or an hour or whatever it is. And there are a ton of parallels with songwriting and production. Um, you've probably heard about, you know, artists who are super picky about who gets to come into the studio with them if they're doing a session, right? Especially if, you know, you're in a big studio, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're by the hour, um, or, you know, maybe you rent it out an Airbnb, uh, you know, in the hills in, uh, in LA, uh, and you know, it's a, it's a mansion and you, you know, you're trying to pop off some hits like that is going to be a, an environment where artists are going to get super picky about who's there because they know they might vibe or not vibe with certain people. And so, you know, they're there to get, to get their best creative work done. Um, and so they're going to want to control that environment. Same thing with, in terms of like decorations in a, in a room, in a studio, again, even people like to, you know, kind of set up shop and cook up in, you know, in, in an Airbnb. Um, if it's a dope spot like that is, that's what pe people do that because they want to capture the creative energy and they want to capture creative sparks that then translate into the medium. And the medium happens to be songwriting and production. But if you're running a meeting of creatives at an, at an agency, or even if you're getting executives to get creative or you want to facilitate and get certain feedback from them, um, you know, you, you've got to do some of the same things that you might do in, in, in a different creative environment, um, right? So, you know, what you're going to eat, how it's going to smell, what music you're playing, like to get in the zone, like how you're going to set up, you know, the, you know, the, the room, uh, are you getting, you know, are there things that people can play with or do, you know, um, in the, in the meeting, these are all things that are tapping into sensory stimulation and all of that gets back to creativity. So your room is to be, you, you know, your role in the room is to be sort of the orchestrator of that experience. Um, and you have to control that environment to get you towards the, the objective. Um, and sometimes that also means making sure like people are not in that room unfortunately. Um, you know, I think being really, really, uh, you're a curator of that room. Um, and you're a curator of that experience. So I think, you know, that, that can be, um, the, I think that's probably the, the most direct parallel that I would say. I also think that, you know, creative ideas can come at any moment and can come from any, but it's usually coming from some sort of sensory stimulus. You know, if you go and walk along the side of a lake or, if you're, um, you know, you're taking a shower, you're swimming, like there's a whole lot of neuroscience around the, you know, that touch and, you know, um, the, the sort of tactile, uh, you know, experience like stimulates creativity, stimulates new ideas. And those, those ideas, you know, they could be musical ideas. They could be, you know, creative ideas that apply to another medium. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've kind of talked about effectiveness and and concepts and and theories to be you know more effective strategists or, or marketers in general um i know we both know at the beginning curiosity is what gets the whole thing started and you have to be market centric and 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 focus on um you know your consumer similarly to where you have to have a similar understanding of you know the people that you're going to have in that room and the relationships that they have with each other um, and yourself to, uh, you know, curate that experience, like, like you mentioned, but I know one topic we haven't talked a whole lot about, um, so far is, is inspiration and that being, you know, a major currency that we, we deal in, um, particularly internally, you know, you've had a ton of time to, to nerd out about the industry, understand every level of consumer where they are. You wrote what you think is, you know, a kick-ass brief and that should get a fire lit under everyone's ass. Um, but maybe it's not, or it's your first time and you've never done anything like that before. Um, how important is is inspiration and in, in getting that fire lit um, you know, to you and the creatives that you you've worked with, whether that's in the studio or or uh in the an agency office setting? 
Yeah. So I think, um, I, I think curiosity is everything. I talk about it as the, this, you know, if you think about the four C's, right. Curiosity is this, is the, is the C of all C's. Um, because you, you know, to build a, you know, to build a brand, you need to find insight, you know, you need to find a human truth, um, to build a brand, you need to often solve a business problem. That means understanding, first of all, diagnosing the problem, uh, and finding the problem and then figuring out the why behind it. So those are all things that are driven by curiosity, right? Curiosity in a cultural context so that, you know, um, you know, brands and clients are staying on top of, you know, how the world is changing and, and what people expect, uh, you know, that's all culturally influenced and you have to be curious about, about culture. Um, but, but you gotta have that curiosity, you know, uh, as, as much about kind of the, you gotta, um, you gotta eat your vegetables too sometimes, right? You've gotta be willing to go, you know, into the data, you've gotta be willing to go um, you know, into the performance analytics, you know, we'll, you know, we'll look at the interviews that have been conducted or the open ends with, uh, with customers, right? Those are the places that can, you can diagnose problems and find kernels of insight and inspiration that can lead to, you know, game-changing innovation, solving a problem, connecting a brand to the heart and mind of a consumer. And, you know, and those things are things that drive business, they drive value, they drive revenue. So, um, you know, you can't, you know, you cannot always attribute those things one to one. Um, but you can use curiosity to get as, as, as close in and as, as specific as possible on the individual area. So I think curiosity is the, is the C of all C's. Um, and, uh, again, I mean, maybe this goes back to studying philosophy in college. Some of that stuff is pretty boring. But if you can get excited about that, um, you can get excited about anything. I'm not ripping on like all philosophers. I think, you know, there's a wide range there. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I think that curiosity is is essential. Yeah, I hear you, man. I mean, I really loved reading Kant in college. Um, yep. Jokes aside, um, there are obviously a lot of parallels between all of those, those different pieces of, of what we took in school. And even for me, where like, honestly, I spent more time focusing on the philosophy side of things because it was you know, something I could really bite my teeth in. Um, whereas like how brands grow by, by Byron Sharp wasn't yep. something that interested me enough, but just the creative side of it where, you know, there I was two years into my end, uh, like into the industry. Um, frantically trying to digest every single word Sharp said to to catch yeah. myself back up. Yeah, uh, How Brands Grow is a really important book. I think it is, you know, it's it is not, um, it's it's not always the easiest narrative, but it is an emotional experience to read that book. I mean, I certainly did. I mean, he he sort of says that at the beginning. Um, you know, he 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 says, you know, stop right here before you read another word what I'm going to tell you might shake you to your boots, you know, or, or, you know, it might really rock you to your, to your core. Um, I think that's a really, really important book for every marketer to read because it is, it's, it's an alternative perspective that's backed by, you know, you know, decades of data and science. Uh, and, you know, it, it, those are fundamentals that again, we all need to be keeping in mind, but, um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there for sure. Yeah, you established the the sandbox. We all thought we were in in the right place. We were on the swings, and he's like, no, 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 that's yeah. that's over here, backed with just like just such heavy hitting truth that uh, if anyone who had done it wrong was like, oh, that's why. Or for anyone who's learning right. from the beginning, absolutely right. Um, check it out. But um, you spend a lot of time at that that intersection between brand performance and, and innovation to, to make a brand most wanted and obviously working super hard to do that um, consistently time over time. Um, that's an incredible feat as it is. Do you have any advice for um, a marketer or aspiring a marketer or advertiser to, to become most wanted for themselves to get into this industry, to get to the places that, that they want to go? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Cooper. Um, again, I would go back to curiosity, find something that, that gets you curious, 
be ruthless uh, in, in the things that you interrogate. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, also don't be afraid to disagree with data sometimes. Um, you know, I was, uh, I just heard a talk uh, at the ANA a couple of weeks ago. There was a CMO for Pearl Vision, uh, Doug, um, gave a great speech and he talked about, you know, data doesn't make decisions. Um, it informs professionals who make decisions. Um, and he talked about how, you know, uh, if you're, but if you're going to disagree with the data make sure you have a clear reason why, make sure you're, you're prepared to defend it. Um, and so I think that that would be another thing too, um, is, is sort of, uh, you know, interrogate everything, get curious, don't be afraid to disagree with the data, but don't be afraid to listen to it also. Um, those, those would be the things that I would sort of say to folks and, and don't be afraid of new experiences. Um, don't be afraid that, you know, uh, don't be afraid to try something new uh, and just kind of jump in. Don't be afraid to get, get into the details. Um, I, you know, I think that's one of the most important skills as a strategist is to know when you need to go deep and then when you need to go high. Um, right. You don't want to go deep at the wrong time, but you may need to go deep in order to make the high level arguments um, that, you know, that people are going to digest. Your job is to digest that stuff um, and, you know, and put it into a uh, a format that people, you know, that's compelling for people that will make the argument that you need to. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely the truth. Um, and I agree, like to your point, even earlier, there's, there's more data than we could have ever gotten our hands on. And there's only ever going to be more, um, as a strategist, you kind of sit and straddle the line behind, like between creative and, and, uh, that data and the kind of the cold numbers. And that oftentimes there can be some confusion between between data being data and the, and the story it's telling versus uh, it being an actual insight that you can you can build something off of. Um, what would you say for for any aspiring marketer or advertiser who's learning to read between the lines with the data that they're that they're looking at and some things that they can practice or, or work on to to come yeah, in ready. Um... I think one one thing uh, that I I mean is very specific, but like learning the difference between an insight and an implication, um, I think that's one thing that it can take a couple years for strategists to to figure out or to really get good at. Um, right? Um, you know, you look you look at data, you look at facts, um, you 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 come up with insights and and uh, even hypotheses, right? Um, but an implication is what is really what it means and, or, and what you're going to do. And so I th that's a basic, you know, sort of like strategist skill set um, that I think folks need to, you know, they often it can take time to hone that. Um, I think that under, you know, figuring out when qualitative uh, data is what you need uh, versus quantitative, um, you know, usually quantitative data can, data can help you diagnose, qualitative data can help you prove or disprove a hypothesis or figure out a, a, a why. Um, it's not completely cut and dry between those two, but, um, you know, there's a different tool for a different uh, situation. Um, and so, you know, getting really good in, in one line of inquiry and insight and then, you know, trying it in a different lane. Uh, and then it gets fun when you can sort of like deploy them as needed. I love it, man. Even even with branding and, and getting messages across to people, it's I feel like a lot of times the practice of repetition. You're not going to be able to lift the the heavy weights until you've you've gotten it down with the with the lighter stuff too, or just you know getting yourself in in the gym at all and and um, and making that progress. Um, and we've talked a lot about different ways for um, aspiring marketers and advertisers to grow themselves. Um, different ways, you know, to make sure they're honing their craft, staying on top of being curious, what it's like to curate a room for, uh, of creatives and, and other strategists and, and talking about effectiveness. Um, but I'd love to hear about what you're doing with, with most wanted co and, and what being at the center of that, uh, intersection of brand and, and innovation and performance means for for y'all and, and what you're doing to change, um, you know, your, your clients for the better and, and the industry for be the better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I, as I kind of said, right, um, we sort of have a, an interdisciplinary practice. Um, you know, we do a lot of work, uh, we work across many different industries, but we've done a lot of work in fashion and apparel, uh, in enterprise tech, 
uh, as well as in CPG. Uh, I think sort of, you know, right now we're, we're sort of on the hunt for, um, you know, some growing brands, uh, you know, partnering directly with, with leaders and with operators. Uh, we have um, an analytics practice that we've built out. Uh, we are big fans uh, and proponents and practitioners of uh, Peter Fader and Dan McCarthy's methodologies on, on LTV. So we really believe in that. Um, and, but we believe in, in sort of purpose and brand building on top of that just as much. So our, our service lines are broken up into sort of three. Um, one is around audience, right? Knowing, knowing customers and really, um, you know, we, I've never worked with a brand that, that didn't need to know their customer better, or perhaps they didn't even, they didn't know their customers at all. Um, so those are, those are foundational, um, pieces of a marketing operation, you know, uh, understanding your customer segments, knowing, you know, who are the light and heavy buyers, who are the most valuable customers, what makes them tick, you know, how can we combine, uh, emotional and psychographic segmentation, you know, with other commercial, uh, ways of cohorting. Uh, to to really like treat customers as an asset. Um, brand is the second uh, service line that we go to market with. So your brand strategy, positioning, building that inside core, that purpose, really zeroing in on what connects with those customers and what the brand what will help the brand stand the test of time. You don't want to have to redo your brand, you know, that often. So it's really important to get it right from the outset. Um, that can be very costly as well. Um, so, you know, uh, brand architecture is a deep area of expertise for us as, again, as well, like figuring out the, um, the relationships between different parts of a portfolio that usually more important for later stage brands, but certainly if you have different product lines, you want to make sure as, as an emerging brand that you are not, um, diluting that core brand that connects and gets you off the ground. Right. Um, so there's a lot in there. Um, and then growth, right. You know, communications, planning. Um, sort of traditional linear comms planning, if that's what's needed. But then also we build teams that really act as an extension of the operating team. We've got kind of a bolt on model where we'll, um, you know, put, uh, you know, a strategist, a data scientist, creative, um, all alongside, um, you know, our client's team and embed them there, um, in a different scenario based on how the brand is set up and what their teams look like, what their needs are. So we plug in in different ways. Um, but we are, uh, we're a boutique firm and we're pretty nimble. So we kind of, we like to play in the, in the sandbox that I just sort of described. I love it, man. It's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to have you on and excited to see what you guys do in, in the future. And we'll definitely be, uh, tuned in to, uh, any updates that you guys have and the cool stuff that you're doing out there. Amazing. Thank you so much for the time, Cooper. Appreciate it. Keep it up.